this evening. Tonight's two gentlemen are not from uh, Britain or from Ireland, but they're from America. But remember these early chapters in Pentecostal pioneers concern the molding influences upon the Pentecostal movement in Britain and in Ireland. And that's why the following gentlemen appear in this chapter. Well, the chief subject of this chapter, which is chapter four of the book, is a man called D. L. Moody. And many of you have heard of him. Now, I want to emphasize two things. Number one, these chapters are not full biographies of these great men of God. Uh, if you want to read more about D.L. Moody, there's a lot out there because his ministry, his life was so exciting. There was so much in it. This is not a full biography of D.L. Moody's life, but it is, in fact, just a snippet of his life to show us and reveal what an influence he had upon the British and the Irish Pentecostal pioneers. We're going to talk about somebody else that was then a fruit. He was a fruit of D.L. Moody's uh, ministry itself. Um, so if you wanted to read full biographies, if, you, if your taste buds are, are, are enticed to read more, let us know because we have so many of these, of these full biographies. But let's get going with Dwight L. Moody. Dwight Lyman Moody, born in 18... Born in 1837, was born in Massachusetts, USA, into a bankrupt family of nine children with a father who loved whiskey, who died when Dwight was just four years old. His mother sent him to a school where he learned very little and to the first congregational church where he learned even less. His upbringing was hard, strict, disciplined, and religious. By 17 years old, the stout young Yankee decided to leave his farming work at home and head for Boston where he became a shoe salesman. There, Dwight L. Moody attended a congregational church which bored him to tears, as did all religious matters. Over the course of the next year, the convicting message preached on sin and righteousness began to affect him, but he made every attempt to raise up a wall of arguments in his mind to stop any heart conviction. He eased his conscience by deciding to leave the matter of conversion until his deathbed. But God's word continued to disturb him. In April 1855, Edward Kimball, a young Sunday school teacher was deeply burdened for Moody's soul. Kimball left his house and made his way to the shoe shop where Moody was working with the intention of confronting Moody about his spiritual condition before God. A thousand contrary thoughts invaded the young man's mind and he almost turned back. When he realized that he'd passed the shop where Moody worked, he finally decided that he would go in and get it over with quickly. With what later he thought was a very weak plea, but with tears in his eyes, he challenged Moody concerning his need of salvation, of God's love toward him, and his need of a personal experience and encounter with Christ. That day in the back of the shoe shop, Moody accepted Christ as savior and Kimball returned home within minutes. The first most obvious change in D.L. Moody was the burden that he received to see all his family saved. Later that year, he moved to Chicago, and although he started to show signs of great business acumen and success, when he encountered the revival in 1857, his business success faded into insignificance in his mind, his heart, and his life. He was ruined by the fires of revival. The success of this world no longer interested him. Instead, he began to glow in Christian virtue. He mixed freely amongst Plymouth Brethren, Methodist Episcopal, Congregationalists, and Baptists. As the years passed by, Moody worked with the YMCA and raised up one of the most unusual children's Sunday schools of that day, which finally became a functioning church. He reluctantly began to preach while struggling every step of the way, 
He turned down congregational ordination and remained a simple, uneducated layman with a burden for souls. Having heard of C.H. Spurgeon's ministry in London, he did all he could to get hold of and to read every Spurgeon sermon. He took thorough hold of Spurgeon's three R's, ruin by the fall, redemption by the blood, and regeneration by the Holy Spirit. This flowed through every one of his messages and was the marrow of Moody's theology. Many thought him too radical, and as a result, nicknamed him Crazy Moody. When his wife, Emma, suffered a bout of severe asthma, the doctor suggested a boat trip. So Moody decided to take her to Britain. In February 1867, they set sail for Britain for the first time. It turned out to be a thoroughly inspiring time for Moody. They visited Spurgeon's Metropolitan Tabernacle with its congregation of 5,000 people. He sat amongst the Plymouth Brethren and heard their most fervent preachers, and he preached for them. He was also invited to speak at some London meetings where his warmth won everyone's affection. He then visited Bristol to see George Muller's work, where 1,500 orphan children were provided for financially without requests for money. Moody was very impressed with what God could accomplish through the prayers of a meek, humble, and gifted godly man. They managed to include Dublin and France in the trip, and then in June, they returned to America. He became very, un, very settled and very successful in ministry in Chicago. He sat on at least 10 separate committees. All the while, he fought the call, call of God to step out as an itinerant evangelist. Ministry for Moody was becoming mechanical. In June 1871, a great burden came upon two older ladies in the congregation to pray that he would receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and fire. These two ladies became very noticeable to Moody as they sat on the front pew and prayed while he preached. When he inquired about their praying, they informed him, Mr. Moody, you need the power of the spirit. At first, Moody could satisfy himself that he was fine and needed no such baptism, but the persistence of these ladies led him to meet and pray with them. They poured out their hearts, asking God to fill his servant with his spirit. From that day forward, a deep hunger and prayer for the Holy Spirit gripped Moody. By October, he was in agony of soul as he prayed and sought God for the promised gift. At times, he would roll on the floor in agony and in tears with a singular prayer pouring out of the heart that he might be baptized in the Holy Ghost and with fire. This was a wrestle between his will and God's. It was that very month that the most of the city of Chicago burnt to the ground, including Moody's work, all his efforts, his organizational committee, committees, all literally went up in a blaze of smoke. Shortly after this, when passing through New York on his way to Britain for the second time, God answered his prayer. As he walked the streets, with his will finally bent before God, the power of the Holy Ghost fell upon him. The Lord drew near and revealed himself to his servant. Moody rushed to a friend's house and asked for a room in which he might be left alone. Hour after hour, he was bathed in the presence of God as the Holy Spirit filled him. This experience was so strong that he cried out to God to stay his hand lest he die. He was filled with the joy of the Lord. When he left that house, it was in the power of the Spirit. He went to England for a few months of rest with the intention of drawing inspiration from other Christian leaders. He had no plans to preach, although he did preach a few times. He attended conventions and conferences and wrote numbers of notes and thoughts. He met with friends who were members of the Plymouth Brethren near Dublin and spent a whole night in fervent prayer with about 20 of these zealous men. The next morning, he walked with Henry Butcher Barley and other brethren men through the streets of Dublin. That day, Varley said something to Moody which deeply impacted him. He said, Moody, 
the world has yet to see what God will do with a man fully consecrated to him. That night, as these words still reverberated in his mind and heart, Moody vowed that by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, he would be that man. All who met with him during this journey in Britain and Ireland were strangely aware that God was preparing this man for a great work and that he was forging him into an effectual instrument. Before returning home, he was persuaded by friends to preach at a congregational church in Arundel Square, London. The message came with real power. As a result of this one message, over 400 new converts were taken into membership during the following week. As other requests to preach reached him, he decided that he would return home and prepare to return to Britain for a period of six months at a later stage. In June 1873, he once again arrived in Liverpool, England, accompanied by his wife and his song leader, Ira Sankey. The key men who were leaders in finances and who had invited him to return with the promise of financial help and a well-organized schedule had died since he was last there. There were no meetings, no funds, and no committees. All seemed lost. Maybe they would have to just return to America. Only one unattractive invitation came in from York in the northeast of England. With no other plans, the little band went to York. It was hard ground, but in the midst of these meetings, one unimpressed minister called F.B. Meyer slowly melted and then ignited with holy fervent fire. Meyer was transformed into one of the greatest preachers and writers in the land. Next, the evangelistic team moved to Sunderland for several weeks of soul-saving meetings where God's power was manifest to change lives for all to see. In August, they journeyed on to Newcastle, where a daily prayer meeting was conducted with some 300 saints in attendance. News spread throughout the whole land that revival was coming to churches and that salvation was being received by hundreds and thousands of souls. Other towns were visited in the same manner with the same result. Next came an invitation to Edinburgh in Scotland. Only eternity will reveal the results of this revival, which started in November 1873. On the first night at the first meeting, 2,000 people had to be turned away from the building, which was already filled to capacity. Before long, Moody had the full backing and support of many great Scottish Presbyterian theologians, as well as most national leaders of every denomination. It was later said, that the revival in Edinburgh was like a Pentecost to the land. Cold Calvinism gave way to fiery evangelism. This great city was startled out of its sleep and stirred to its very depths. In the new year, they traveled on to Dundee, Glasgow and other places in Scotland. This was not successful evangelism. It was heaven sent revival. When their nine months of ministry in Scotland came to an end, the revival burned on. In September 1874, they travelled to Belfast in the north of Ireland for five weeks of meetings like those in Scotland. Then onward to Dublin in the south of Ireland for a month, where several thousand were reported converted. These were some of the most remarkable meetings ever held in the south of Ireland. In November, they sailed for England and continued to minister in the main cities and towns. In March 1875, he moved to London to start a four-month campaign where he reached the rich and poor, the famous and destitute, princesses as well as paupers. Initially, attendance amounted to about 16,000 people, but it is estimated that in the end, around one and a half million people heard him in this chief of cities. After one very brief visit to Cambridge University, he returned home to America and did not come back again until 1882, when he ministered once more in Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and England. In November, 1882, when he spoke at Cambridge University, he was filled with great anxiety 
This was the educational center for Britain's aristocratic and wealthy youth and had a reputation of unparalleled riotous behavior. The first night at a prayer meeting, Moody spoke on the spirit's power for service. The university vicar, Handley Moore, was somewhat nervous. The young unsaved CT stud greatly doubted if this Yankee was up to the task. At that first meeting on the Monday, there were 1,700 students in attendance. As Sankey sang his sacred hymns, they jeered and laughed and shouted. When Sankey finished, he was near to tears. As Moody preached on Daniel in the lion's den, how appropriate, again, they laughed, shouted. They did all in their power to disturb him, but Moody maintained his calm. By the end of the week, at least 200 students had accepted Christ as their savior. Amongst them was the main ringleader who later went as a missionary to China and became Bishop of Hong Kong. Out of this mission came the famous Cambridge Seven who went to China as missionaries. This campaign bore fruit that touched the youth of the nation. During the summer of 1883, he returned home to get refreshed but soon traveled again, first to Ireland and then to, November, uh, to London in November. For the next eight months, he held his greatest meetings yet in the capital. Many of his best new laborers were converts from his earlier meetings in 1875. This new campaign sealed the future destiny of many young men who would later go to the mission field. It was not long after Moody's death in 1899 that his sermons were sold in Britain second only in demand to Pilgrim's Progress and were in print right across the globe. This, however, is a mere summary of a man who showed the world what could be done when a man was fully consecrated unto God and baptized in the Holy Ghost. Another American mentored by Moody was R.A. Torrey. R.A. Torrey followed Moody's example in dynamic evangelistic ministry. The very well-educated Torrey was delivered from German higher criticism, from biblical criticism and liberalism and converted to Christ and to a full belief in the inspired truth of the Bible. He also had a real experience of being baptized in the Holy Ghost, which led to an international soul-winning ministry similar to Moody's. There is no doubt that he took up the mantle that Moody left behind. Between 1900 and 1907, Tory campaigned across many nations in Europe, with calls coming from many leaders in New Britain. With Charles Alexander, his song leader, at his side, Tory campaigned in Scotland. Ireland, both North and South, and England. Again, like Moody, he preached to leaders, believers, and churches concerning their absolute need of the baptism in the Holy Ghost to have power to witness. Tory was another living witness to this truth as he gathered in a mighty harvest of souls for Christ. His book, The Holy Spirit, Who He Is and What He Does, is to this very day a classic which has opened the minds and hearts of many to the scriptural teaching on the baptism in the Holy Spirit. This book was handed down to Keith from his grandparents. He can clearly remember reading this book in his teens. It grounded and confirmed him further in this truth, a truth which he had already experienced at that time. His own great-grandmother went to go and hear Tory when he visited Belfast and thereafter followed his weekly teachings in the Christian Herald, which later prepared her to receive the message of Pentecost. These were not only men to teach the, the only men to teach the baptism in the Holy Spirit as a separate distinct experience from that of the new birth or born again experience, but during these early days of the reformation of the Swiss Brethren movement, also called the Anabaptists, which later birthed the Baptist churches, they experienced outpourings of the Holy Spirit and personal infillings of the Spirit. Now, this was during the 1520s and the 1530s, resulting in them speaking in tongues, in prophecy, other, and other gifts of the Spirit. 
during the same century, now we're talking about the 16th century, similar things were noted amongst the persecuted French Huguenots. Some of the foremost English Puritans, such as Richard Sibbs, Thomas Goodwin, and John Owen, taught of a sealing and anointing of the spirit, which was a separate and distinct from the indwelling of the spirit at the time of salvation. Others, like George Fox, Charles Finney, A.B. Simpson, and a host of other godly leaders sought and experienced what they called the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Later, after the beginning of the Pentecostal revival, there were still those outside this new movement like W.P. Nicholson, Reese Howells, Billy Sunday, James A. Stewart, James S. Stewart, Oswald J. Smith, Duncan Campbell, and Martin Lloyd-Jones, who all taught the necessity of a definite baptism in the Holy Ghost. No matter how hard evangelicals and fundamentalists fight this truth of the baptism in the spirit, they will never quieten the voice of John the Baptist, ringing down through the century saying, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. It is worth noting that Moody and Tory were certainly among the main founders of what later became known as fundamentalism. It was a movement which made a steadfast stand for the basic, fundamental, or foundational doctrines of the Bible in an hour of increasing theological apostasy. In those days, it was taken for granted that a genuine Christian was fundamental in all his basic beliefs. Although the pioneer Pentecostal leaders were assuredly fundamentalists in doctrine, they were distinct from the later fundamentalist movement, which not only rejected Pentecostal manifestations, but also rejected the teaching of a real baptism in the Holy Ghost. However, we could easily challenge those who themselves consider biblical <clears throat> fundamentalists to return to scripture and to the historic roots by seeking for a true biblical baptism in the Holy Ghost. Now, what legacy did D.L. Moody hand to the Pentecostals? First, his evangelistic preaching helped to bring about the conversion of Cecil Polhill. That's one testimony I can't wait to read to you. Cecil Polhill was one of the Cambridge Seven and the first founder of the Pentecostal missions in Britain. Tory was also used of God to see young Willie Burton, one of my heroes, another of our pioneers come to salvation in Christ. Moody's clear, powerful experience of the baptism in the Holy Spirit, as well as his constant emphasis on such an experience, which was strengthened by Tory's clear scriptural teaching on the subject, was tailor-made for the coming Book of Acts revival. Moody frequently told Tory to preach on the subject, especially to those seeking to serve God, after salvation through the blood and the study of the scriptures, this was what he believed to be the next most necessary thing in a believer's life. Moody's testimony and sermons were read by many of the future Pentecostal leaders and believers. When young T.B. Barrett began to preach, he used Moody's written sermons. Moody also showed this new movement how mass evangelism could be carried out by campaigning from town to town and city to city in Britain and Ireland in the power of the Holy Spirit. He defined and exemplified the ministry of the revival evangelist. Moody's whole life, message and ministry were readily and agreeably received by the new Pentecostal pioneers. Moody and Tory gave a clear understanding to the Irish and British Pentecostals that the primary purpose of the baptism in the Holy Spirit was an empowerment for witness, for service in the local church, the local community, and for missionary activity abroad. They emphasized the absolute necessity for each believer to be baptized in the Spirit as a real definite experience in order to receive power for service. Another aspect which left a mark on the early Pentecostal movement was the fact that Moody had a song leader called Sankey and Tory had a song leader called Alexander. <clears throat> 
These song leaders sang the gospel with full hearts. They sang songs full of biblical doctrine, laying out the suffering work of Christ on the cross in bleeding and dying for sinners. They wooed sinners to salvation in Christ by song. They ministered in the campaigns and meetings, backing up the clear, simple preaching of the cross with easy to remember songs that the new converts could carry home and sing. And finally, Moody recovered a practice which was later manifest right across the Pentecostal movement, that of being an unordained layman. He had no formal training, training, no ordination, he had no title and no official qualifications. His only qualifications were his call from God, his God-given gift of preaching, and his endowment of power by the Holy Ghost. This last qualification was the outstanding prominent need for ministry, which he emphasized. A man can be trained, a man can be educated, a man can be qualified, respected, followed. But if he is not anointed from on high, all his preaching and labors will be in vain. Our Pentecostal pioneers did not despise training or education, as we shall see in the following chapters. But they did gain a healthy, balanced perspective through the God-given ministry of Moody. Today, an unhealthy emphasis on higher education, historic studies, or educational degrees or qualifications has crept into the realms of Pentecostal denominations as a reaction against the unbiblical, spirit-centered, manifestation-oriented theology, which since the 1960s has gained prominence within Pentecostal churches. These opposite extremes, with their wrong emphases, have moved the Pentecostal churches in the wrong directions. It is time to come back to a biblical experience of true Pentecost based upon a sanctified biblical intellect. Amen. <laughs>